And we are back, ready to start game four of Rhett against Castro, with Rhett up 2-1, which means that I am that much closer to Sean being up 0-1 against Friendly Neighborhood Chill. Oh, I'm so sad, I'm so sad. So we see here they've got cross positions, actually. Castro in the yellow zerg at, uh, I'm going to say this is 9.30, and Rhett is down at 3.30 in the blue zerg. Yeah, and, and for once... We don't have both players, uh, or one of the two players, being able to scout the opponent right off the bat. Both of them are going up to the top right, where their overlords will, you know, cuddle a little bit and hang out, and then just uh, approach each other's bases. So, um, already, it's going to be kind of interesting to see how both players deal with being in the dark. Because we have talked, you know, like, oh, Rhett has really good builds, really, you know, a ton of economic advantage. But he did have the, the nice benefit of seeing exactly what his opponent has been up to in all three games this series. Right, very true. I'm taking a look at both of their mains, and I'm always interested as a Zerg player to make sure the Zer uh, Zergs are putting their drones on the fastest mining minerals. And I can tell you with 100% certainty, Rhett has been doing it, but Castro hasn't. And that means the drones from Castro oh. have been coming out just a little bit slower. And we see here he's going for a 9 pool, so a little bit of a deviation here. We're going to hope Rhett doesn't go 12 hatch because he could be in trouble depending on how Castro decides to follow this up. And he's following it up with gas. Oh, man, it looks like a super aggressive 9 pool coming up right now by Castro. I like this sort of play on these maps. Um, just throwing it in every once in a while, not making it necessarily your standard on these maps. It's good to focus on the stable play, but you know you've already seen from previous games that Red is capable of 12 hatching, and especially on these maps, these are where players are primed and ready always to do some sort of early expand. And look at Rhett doing the 12 pool, or yeah, 12 pool, 12 gas, almost certainly a 12 hatch coming up, and this 9 pool with speed this fast might just crush Rhett, uh, Rhett's front door down early. Right, that's what I'm a little bit nervous about. If it was a normal 9 pool, well then uh, 12 pool and then expansion on 11 or 12, however you do it, is going to be you know very, very strong against that. You're going to have enough Zerglings to defend, but Castro is going to have an extremely fast Zergling speed. We can see he's taking a drone off now. That's a standard 9 pool speed build. Get, uh, over or get Zergling speed and then take one drone off. And he's got six Zerglings coming out, so Rhett might have a timing here. I mean, he's just building his Zerglings now. It looks like only four, six, one coming now. Uh, there's going to be a timing where when speed finishes, he could be in a lot of trouble and just get his natural broken, as you said. Yeah, and if you're not careful in Rhett's position... Um... Well, actually, the, the standard way, whether you are careful or whether you're not, it's just up to Castro. If Castro plays this out properly, he's going to force Rhett to turtle. He's going to force Rhett to make too many Zerglings, and Rhett's going to have to make a bunch of Spore Colonies. And then Castro's going to have leeway to do whatever he wants with his Mutilus early on, which means that at the top and the bottom, these Overlords of Rhett's that are floating in the middle of the map, super vulnerable. We're going to put that on hold and go right to Rhett's natural. Ooh, Rhett had a really nice concave, and his ooh, almost kills two Zerglings for free. Ooh, that's not the way you want to function a nine pool at this stage in the game. Seriously, he, Castro needs to keep those all alive as long as possible until speed is done. Then he can get in, harassed, and Red has these two drones in front. That's going to screw up the AI of Castro's Zerglings, and it's also going to allow the, you know, the five damage acid shot, or spines, or whatever it is, from the drone to also deal damage. Second hatchery up now, Red is going to be making a lot of Zerglings trying to defend this, but looks like he's supply block at 18. He's, here comes the attack, a bit of a miscue there by Castro. He's got to find the right spot to move in, get get Rhett kind of bunched up where he can get a nice concave around or force him to go around. I really feel and like Castro needs to do damage. just finished for Rhett. Right? He's just going to come right back right now. Look at this. Beautiful defense. And now Rhett, even willing to bring his drones pretty far out. I mean, this is the really awful position you don't want to be in as the nine pulling player. Speed just finishes for Rhett. That is just... Ugh. I mean, right now, look, Rhett just needs to spend a little bit of time hanging out. That Overlord's going to finish. He's going to make a few extra Zerglings. And then he's going to sprint directly towards Castro's base. And Castro's going to have to make uh, a Sunken Colony. Going to have to be on the defensive. And it's really going to be up to Castro's Mutilus Control to see if he can pull through this game. Right, and this is the position where I feel like if Castro just gets out three Mutilus, it's not going to be enough because Red is going to be streaming in Zerglings. But look like he's not streaming in Zerglings. He's actually getting drones. I find that a little surprising. And his Spire is not even up. Uh, making an Overlord now before Spire. Red, you got to be careful, man. Let's take a look at Castro's Spire. It's at 400 HP, so Red may be opting for the Evolution Chamber and going for Spores. I find that a little strange, given he has such an advantage here to let Castro get Mutilus out. 
You know, I don't actually mind doing this so much. I don't mind getting the spores. I mean, ordinarily, if your opponent's being super aggressive, you can't even afford to get the Spire at the stage as Rhett. So I think it's, you know, great to get the Spire down. Throw down the Evolution Chamber if you can. It looks like Rhett, actually, let's just take all that back. Rhett making a ton of Zerglings right now, doing an excellent job of reinforcing that. He's going to be putting a ton of pressure on right there. And then look at the Evolution Chamber timing. This is brilliant. Right now, right as the Spire finishes, you just get that Evo Chamber up. You just throw down about four spores. And ordinarily, you don't have this good of an economy when you're in Rhett's position. He has a ton of drones. He's going to have plenty of money to throw those spores down. And since he got that Spire up so early, he can opt to rely on the spores for, dis for defense and just get a super early upgrade. And that's a very cute alternative. Yeah, and, and to kind of facilitate making all these defensive structures. He took his drones off gas for a while. Looks like he's taken another drone off at the main. He's only got two on gas, and I like that because a lot of players feel like gas is so important, but, you know, they get up to, like, 50 minerals, and they're just struggling to make a drone when they're at, like, 400 gas or something like that. So we see yeah. this four up now defending. Uh, it's at this position to defend Rhett from harassing the Zerglings, and then, uh, or excuse me, it's at Rhett is... Okay, let's try this again. Rhett wants <laughs> to defend this Round alleyway, two. so the... <laughs> so the Mutalist can't create a gap where Castro runs his Zerglings into the main. So that's why it's more focused here rather than uh, focusing on defending the drone so much. Yeah, and this is the this is the key period right now for Castro. What Castro needs to do is just run around and pick off all these overlords. And look at the amount of mineral pressure that we're seeing from Rhett's end. I mean, if you just click around in Rhett's main, he's building these extra overlords. And then if you see his money count, he is dead broke. That said... That's normal for this kind of play, and you still don't have this big of an economic lead. Rhett has huge amount of leeway to do whatever he wants. The second gas is coming up. I really think it would benefit him to get that super early upgrade. And it looks like Castro doing the right thing, keeping everything in gas as long as possible, getting his expansion up relatively quickly. Because, um, I mean, right now he can't do any Zergling run by Antics. He can't put any pressure on Rhett because Rhett is just locked up tight at his front with that Sunken and those two spores. So if I'm in Castro's position, I feel a little bit uncomfortable because at this point I, I'm thinking, should I be making only Mutalis or should I be making drones? Because it's kind of a double-edged sword. If I make only Mutas, well, he's got two gases and, uh, you know, I don't even have enough drones to defend all that. But if I make only Absolutely. drones and he decides to attack, well, then I just screwed myself too. So we see Castro being good, being aggressive with these few Mutalis. They're going to regenerate from those few spore hits. So I like this, just putting a little pressure on. Looks like Red is deciding to move out at this time. That's a little strange, but we'll see what happens. It's perfect. Look, these Mutalists are tucked away at the right side of Red's base. And it, when Red's counterattacking, he's going to the opposite end of the earth. I mean, there's no way these Mutalists are going to be able to come back in time. This might just be the winning blow right here. And at the very least, it's going to prevent this expansion from being finished. Look, Red just target firing it. Coming in right now, picking off some Zerglings, but Castro's getting a little too scared to bring all his Zerglings down the ramp. And the Hatchery's getting close to finish, but takes about half health damage. Castro is able to repel the attack, but not without really feeling the pressure of his situation. Yeah, I, I like what Castro did there. Didn't rush in, let, uh, let the Zerglings just stream in, and then came back and defended it. Looks like he played really well, I think, there. And we take a look at the supplies. Red at 42, Castro at 41, so we're evening it up. I think he's taking a little too much damage here, trying to focus on this extractor. Almost getting his Mutalist picked off by Red's Mutalist. You don't want that to happen. And uh, we're with uh, with the expansion up for Castro, we're kind of settling into a longer game. Taking a look at the Spire of Red, he's got that Carapace 50% done. So looks like, uh, like Artosis, your voice can cut through space and time to speak to Red. Oh, why, well, thank you. It's good to know that Rhett's hearing me in the future, from the past, making sure he gets that plus one upgrade, because, you know, if he isn't already in a good enough situation, he at the very least needs to make me happy, because he knows I have my five eSport bucks on the line. It's very yeah, important huge. that I grab that. And if you look back at Castro's base, Castro doesn't have the opportunity to get that very early upgrade. A little bit too much gas building up for Castro right now. He's going to have to either make a whole bunch of Scourge, or start making a, a bunch of extra drones, just some way to repair that huge disparity between his money and his gas right now. I mean, at this point in time, Wretch needs to play it safely and intelligently, and with all these defensive structures, he's going to be in great shape. So it looks like Castro is doing all threes, making a few mutilous drones and Scourge. I feel like Scourge are very effective at the start of the game, and it's also nice to get a few Scourge uh, to kind of drive back the Mutalus so you can get free shots with your Mutalus while they're running away. We see Red also making a few Scourge now like that. But 
Castro is so much gas. If he invests it all in Scourge, it's going to be like, I don't know, like 20 Scourge. It's, that's too much. That's not the kind of thing he needs because they're going to lose their effectiveness. They're going to be doubling up, not dealing the full damage that they could. Here we go. Here's Rep moving out with his little uh, Mutalisk, or not really that little, but uh, his plus one Carapace <laughs> Mutalisk army and a few Scourge trailing behind. Yeah, oh, and here comes Rhett right here, just sprinting towards the natural, stopping to kill off these overlords. He knows he has a huge advantage. He's been mining gas all that extra time, and Castro's in a serious run. Let's see if these scourge from Castro can do it, but all the mutilists have stopped moving. It looks like Castro's mutilists are dropping like flies. Only five mutilists remaining, and Rhett has a full control group and bringing his zerglings in the front just for the extra little bit of hurt. And it looks like Rhett is going to be able to take out this expansion. No Mutalisks left anywhere for Castro. Some Scourge trying to pop in there. And look, oh, fancy schmancy micro to wrap the series up with Rhett winning 3-1. Very nice series uh, there. Castro really impressed me with the ZBZ, but at the end of the day, Rhett is the victor. He's not going to feel upset that he didn't go Terran. Uh, that would have been disastrous if he had the choice. He probably would have regretted that for the rest of his life. But showing his ZVZ is very strong. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of funny because we spend so much time talking about that, you know, fancy schmancy, um, mutilist micro that Rhett was known for. Um, but we didn't actually see it so much. It was a little bit more of, you know, Zergling-oriented stuff. It was a little bit more of um, just build order and just solid gameplay and that sort of thing. So we have right now, coming up next, we have Mondragon against Brat, okay, but for now, it looks like we have an interview with our friendly Rhett winner. How are you doing today, Rhett? Hey, I'm uh, obviously doing pretty good. Uh, happy that I won. I'm also very happy with the advertisement for my uh, new rapper name. That's uh, it's going to be my next career. Good old little <laughs> Rhett. That's me. Well, other than, you know, other than working on your beats, why don't you tell us a little bit what you did to prepare for this match? Because, I mean, everyone... First of all, wants to know why you chose to play uh, Zerg as opposed to Terran, and also what you were doing um, to prepare for this match in particular, knowing that you're, you're not as familiar with Zerg vs. Zerg as you are with Terran vs. Zerg. Yeah, well, the the last month while I was in Korea, uh, I was planning on doing one more Courage, so uh, I was practicing my CVZ quite a bit, and then uh, coincidentally, Flav beat uh, G5, so I had a Zerg opponent in TSL, so for the, like the last two weeks before that last Courage uh, tournament I played, I was playing like only ZVZ with like uh, oh, Cole yeah. and uh, and like Mondragon and people like that. So I was getting more and more confident. And then in my Courage tournament also, uh, I had four four Zergs in a row, and I didn't to do too bad. So my confidence just kept growing, and I just decided to uh, stick with what I had been playing. So when you found out your opponent was Castro, what went through your head? Did you know anything about Castro beforehand? Uh, any particular strengths or weaknesses? Did you make any adjustments to your play knowing who he was? Uh, yeah, I've, I've had quite a few uh, TVZ experiences with him in the past uh, year and a half or so. Uh, even in the first TSL, in Clan Wars, uh, a couple of tournaments. So I knew a lot about him ZVT. And uh, the last time we played was actually right before I went to Korea. And he beat me in a Zotac Cup final, ZVT. So with that in the back of my mind, and just uh, thinking about how much GVZ I've been playing, um, it ended up being a pretty easy choice for me, actually. Of course, he so, was. Uh... Oh, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. he's. <laughs> he was quite scary, scary to me though, because he's been at the top of the you know foreign Zerg scene for like three years. So I was th thinking like, oh my, he must have so much experience GVZ, but um, it still didn't affect my choice. So, I mean, I want to talk a little bit about the series, but in particular, what were you expecting going into Game 1? Because Game 1, as we saw, was absolutely insane. Were you shaken up by that experience at all, or was that just, you know, an ordinary day in the life of Rhett with one old extractor keeping you steady and in the game? <laughs> no, I definitely think I was uh, really pushing my, my, my luck there with uh, how I won. But um, I, I have since I got back to the Netherlands, I haven't been playing that much. Like I've just been seeing family and friends. Uh, but instead, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, uh, what builds I should use and how Castro is going to play. And I think that today, um, my my builds were a perfect prediction of, of how he was going to play, and um, I'm just happy it worked out. Awesome. At, at what point in the series were you very confident that you could win, or were you were you still just feeling a little bit? uncomfortable straight into game four? Uh, the first two games, 
um, I, I 12 hatch and he 12 pulled and you know he made it very very difficult for me and he even took a game for me so after those two games I was feeling like huh uh, this isn't going so well so I, I really need to step it up and then after the outsider game in which we played similar builds and even though he uh, he was in my base a lot with one ling or two lings after I beat him with a muta battle um, I felt really comfortable because I also I already knew he was gonna nine pool on tornado most likely so you know I just had a good a good feeling about my builds and my predictions in this series awesome awesome what was it like watching yourself play and watching Chill and I just blabber on about you? And how did it feel to win me five esports box in particular? Well, of course, I'm very excited about your esports money and expect uh, a nice little treatment from the esports store from you. Holla little red. Other than that, it was uh, it was quite a fun experience to watch you guys come and take my play. Uh, I really enjoyed it, and in the on the outsider game in game three, when uh, you talked about my overlord being like far away. Uh, I, I felt like, oh my god, he's really saying this because I'm losing this Overlord like six seconds later. So I, I really enjoyed uh, the high-level commentary, for sure. Oh, well, thank you. It's, it's always good to just let everyone know that I am, in fact, clairvoyant. I just sacrificed 20 virgins this morning to make sure that I could talk about that Overlord and just sound smart. So I'm glad to know it paid <laughs> off. Do you have any predictions for the next round against uh, Mondragon vs. Brad OK? Um, I think it's going to be a really, really good series. Um, Mondragon's been playing a little bit more lately, so um, I think if he can play his best, you know, Brad OK is a very, very strong player. I think we'll see we'll see an awesome mm -hmm. series. Definitely. And lastly, I just got to ask, how do you feel about playing Sen next round in the round of eight? Um, it's just another ZBZ, and obviously I'm not too happy about that. I would have much rather, you know, showed off my, <laughs> my other matchups, but, you know, what can you do? I got I got kind of lucky today, and hopefully I'll be lucky next time. And uh, it should it should work out. Well, hey, thanks so much for the interview, Rhett, and congratulations on getting into the round of eight. We look forward to casting you next week in the, against Sen. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope you guys see some more good games. Thanks. Cheers. And we're just gonna go right back over to you, Chill.